We often hear that in meditation there's no thinking. Everything is very quiet. And so when we sit down to focus on the breath, we get frustrated to see that the mind is still talking to itself about the breath, and that it wanders off and talks to itself about something else, and then comes back and talks about the breath. Well, it's important to realize that talking to yourself is a necessary part of getting the mind to settle down. The Buddha calls it directed thought and evaluation. It's one of the factors of jhana strong concentration. And then even when the questions and answers settle down, there's still perceptions, the images you hold in your mind, and those carry you all the way through many of the even very refined levels of concentration. So the trick is not so much stopping your thinking, but learning how to think properly in a way that helps you to settle down. So what are you saying to yourself about the breath right now? You can ask yourself if the breath feels good. Where do you feel the breath? What concept of breath are you using? There's the breath of the air coming in and out through the nose. There's also the breath of the energy movements in the body. Some of those are fairly obvious and others are not so obvious. So which ones are you going to pay attention to? Which ones can you pay attention to? That's a useful question. Which ones are clear enough so you can maintain your focus? All the, way th all the way through the in-breath, all the way through the out, many, many, many breaths. So you search around in the body and find some breathing sensations that look like they're easy to follow, and you give them a try. And you try to stick with it as much as you can, and then after all, you, you can question yourself and evaluate it. Did that work? And there can be different reasons for why it didn't work if it didn't. Either you, you had other issues that were gnawing away at the mind, or you're having trouble keeping track of the breath as it gets more subtle. So you move around and find something else. Or you can turn on the issues, the things that are eating away at you. And John Mahabua has a very useful analogy for different ways of getting the mind to settle down. He said, in some cases, your mind is like a tree standing out in the middle of a meadow. If you want to cut the tree down, you can cut it down in any direction, and you don't have to think too much about which direction is possible and which one is not, because they're all possible, because nothing is interfering with a tree in any direction at all. In other cases, though, you're trying to cut down a tree in the middle of a forest, and here you have to look at where are the spaces between the other trees. Which direction can you cut the tree in, so it's not just going to be leaning on other trees? And before you cut the trunk, do you have to cut some of the branches? Because otherwise, if they're entangled, even though you cut the trunk, the tree's not going to come down. So sometimes your mind is like the tree out in the middle of the meadow, and sometimes it's like the tree in the forest. It's got some entanglements, and you've got to learn how to cut them away. This is what a lot of the different contemplations are for, the contemplation of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. They deal with times when you're feeling discouraged in the practice. Contemplation of death when you're feeling lazy, realizing that death could come at any time. You've got work to do in your mind if you want to be ready to die and not suffer from it. Contemplation of the body helps with all kinds of things. If you have issues of lust, you can think about the different parts of the body and realize there's nothing there that's really worthy of lust. You take off the skin and you wouldn't want to look at it. If you have issues of vanity around the body, again, 
You, you look at your body, you look at other people's bodies, and they're all made of this stuff. So if you find that there are issues that are entangling you, you try to think in ways that help you step back and say, that's really not worth getting involved in. You start out with some of the standard contemplations, and if they don't work, you can adjust them. So they do work for your particular case. What is your particular set of entangling branches? And what saw is going to work on those branches? That's where you have to use your ingenuity. Some of the basic patterns are there, and they are very helpful. And usually what you end up doing is taking the basic patterns and then adjusting them a little bit. Then you can get back to the breath. And here you can start trying some of the various ways of perceiving the breath that help you to settle in, seep into the body, so you really do feel solidly placed here, solidly rooted. Think of the breath as the energy going through the blood vessels. And where are your blood vessels right now? They're all over the place, and they get smaller and smaller and smaller, and you get more and more refined. Can you make your awareness more refined in the same way? Or you can think of the body as basically an energy field. Even the solid parts of the body are made of atoms that are mostly space. The energy can pass through that space. Try holding that perception in mind. See if that helps. All of this is necessary to get the mind to settle down. You reach a point where things are nice enough, the body feels open enough, everything is at ease, and you can settle down. There may be little spots here and there where there's some patterns of tension that you can't undo just yet, but you say, well, I'll learn to live with those for the time being, and get your nourishment from the areas that you can make comfortable. That's when you can let go of some of the grosser aspects of the thinking that got you to settle down. But the thinking is important, and learning to observe your thinking is one of the ways in which you gain some insight. The questions that you pose to yourself. You can watch yourself create a question and then decide, no, I don't think that question is going to work, and you can put the question aside. That ability to drop a question is really, really important. It's one of the hallmarks of wisdom, knowing which questions are worth pursuing and which ones are not. And just because a question has grabbed your attention doesn't mean that it's really worthwhile. So as you're working with the breath, you begin to get a sense of which questions are helpful in getting the mind to settle down, which ones are not. Which ways of thinking are helpful, which ways of perceiving are helpful, which ones are not. And you begin to realize you've got choices here. Just because a thought comes into your mind doesn't mean you have to pursue it. A question can come into your mind, you don't have to pursue it. Now, the Buddha's not telling you not to ask questions at all. He wasn't the sort of person who said, well, just follow my instructions, don't think. It will guarantee you enlightenment in X number of days or X number of months. That's turning the mind into a, a factory. You just think you can put it through the process and that'll be it. The way you gain insight into things is by asking the right questions and then trying to figure out the right way to answer them. And that requires you exercise your own ingenuity. Insight isn't something that can be processed like cheese. Or if it is processed, it is like processed cheese. It's not all that good for you. You want to exercise in learning how to ask yourself the right questions and then figure out how to approach them so you can get a useful answer. And you start that with here. 
conversing with yourself about the breath. And then stepping back and being able to watch the process of the conversation, you learn an awful lot about the mind right there. Then when you're ready to settle down, okay, that's what all the conversation was for, right now at least. So you can be with a breath with a minimum amount of signaling to yourself, okay, this is the breath, here we're staying with the breath, and the breath feels good, and then it feels like it's saturating the body. And then it just becomes breath, breath, breath. And the mind can settle down like that. That's one of the signs that your questioning has worked. And your ability to step back from the questions and watch the process, that leads to a different kind of calm. The calm that comes when you realize that okay, just because a question pops into your mind doesn't mean you have to find an answer to it. And you can look at the desire behind some of those questions. And that's when you really get to see a lot of the motivations going on in the mind. Where your greed is, where your aversion is, where your delusion is, where your lust is, where your fears are. And when you get to the point where you're not driven by those things, because you can step back, that's an even greater level of calm. So we're pursuing both because you find them together. The important thing is you keep your conversation focused right here.